Jimmy Kimmel, famed, charismatic American TV host, once sent his reporters onto the street to ask children about love and relationships. The answers were insightful. Love is a, a mysterious thing, right, Guillermo? Right, Jimmy. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> Love is, uh, it's difficult to put into words. So with the most romantic day of the year approaching on Sunday, we thought it would be fun to go out on the street to ask children to explain love. And, well, this is what they had to say. What is love? What is love? I have no idea. What is love? Um, love is when you love somebody. And it's when you love somebody, and it's really when you love somebody. But what does Jane Austen have to say about love and relationships in Sense and Sensibility? Stay tuned, you're watching Schofield on Shakespeare, not talking about Shakespeare, but talking about Jane Austen instead. Patriarchal restrictions on opportunities for women in the early 19th century meant that finding a husband was far more important than it is nowadays. Writing on the British Library website, Catherine Sunderland makes reference to the fact women's lives in the early 19th century were limited in opportunity, before writing that Jane Austen understood that marriage was women's best route to financial security and social respect. It is therefore unsurprising that a number of women in the text resort to ruthless, manipulative scheming in order to achieve this goal of power and financial security through marriage. Lucy Steele is particularly successful on this front, capturing consecutively not one but two highly eligible men likely to inherit or already in possession of a wealthy mother's fortune. Her first engagement to Edward Ferrers is revealed towards the very end of Volume 1 in chapter 22. Our reaction to this revelation needs to be scrutinised carefully. As readers we have long empathised with the dignified Eleanor who evidently fell in love with and grew to deeply respect Edward during his visit to Norland towards the beginning of the novel. In chapter 4 Eleanor defended him vigorously to her underwhelmed sister concluding that at present I know him so well that I think him really handsome or at least almost so. Following Marianne's typically presumptuous jumping of the gun by openly proclaiming an imminent marriage, Ed Eleanor cries, Believe my feelings to be stronger than I have declared. Believe them, in short, to be such as his merit and the suspicion the hope of his affection for me may warrant without imprudence or folly. But further than this, you must not believe. It is impossible not to admire Eleanor's dignity and breathlessly hopeful restraint here. Her use of metanoia in switching suspicion to hope shows the control she is seeking to exert over her language, which in turn is intended to steady her emotions. To suspect another man's feelings without having them confirmed and then tell another about them would be presumptuous folly and ultimately self-defeating, potentially humiliating act of impropriety. Eleanor realises this the moment she utters the word suspicion and so promptly changes it to hope. And indeed she leaves Norland without a marriage proposal, merely continuing to harbour repressed feelings within her bosom. Lucy's revelation thus comes as a hammer blow particularly as she also discloses the fact they were secretly engaged long before the blissful period in which Edward and Eleanor got on so well at Norland, so much so that her mother declared that in a few months, my dear Marianne, Eleanor will be in all probability be settled for life. And so when Lucy reveals that she has been engaged to Edward, the reader empathises with Eleanor, who has followed the perfect passive path of restraint, quietly loving woman for so long without rewards. 
But as ever with Austin, our reactions are not straightforward, especially those of the modern reader. Just because Lucy has usurped Eleanor and is strengthening her admittedly precarious position by manipulating her rival into becoming her unwitting silent supporter doesn't mean that we immediately vilify her. Following her revelation, Lucy pours out her fears and just because she may have calculated the value in doing so, i.e. to prompt Eleanor into extinguishing her lingering hopes, doesn't mean that they aren't genuine and deserve a degree of sympathy. I have no doubt in the world of your faithfully keeping this secret, she says, because you must know of what important it is to us not to have it reach his mother, for she would never approve of it, I dare say. I shall have no fortune, and I fancy she is an exceeding proud woman. We do not meet Mrs Ferris until much later in the novel, chapter 12 of volume 2. But early on we are geared up to anticipate her as being frightful. She is the mother of the dreadful Fanny, who has made her snobbery and social pretensions quite apparent. So whilst we may be mildly repulsed by Lucy's extremely convenient befriending of Eleanor, we would be heartless not to empathise a little with her plight. Austin shows us the appalling passivity of a woman, especially one with no fortune, held within a secret relationship. Yes, some unspecified point in the future may usher in social ease and comparative prosperity, but until that point happens, there is nothing for the woman to do but wait and hope. And at this point in the novel, Lucy has been waiting for four years. Eleanor's exclamation. I can't help understand why Lucy behaves as she does. As a young woman in the 19th century without a fortune, she has a pitiful amount of power and possibilities. She is fortunate enough to be pretty, uses this one trump card to ensnare a young man living in a depressing world where sex before marriage is much harder to come across. And then she defends this position with all she's got, which unfortunately means swatting a fellow female under the cover of a friendly, grateful smile. The reader is not given many details about the actions and processes that led to Edward and Lucy's engagement. Much later in the book, Edward describes the initial attachment as a foolish, idle inclination on my side, the consequence of ignorance of the world and want of employment. And my impression is that the attraction was to some extent a natural one between two teenagers, which in our society would have produced some initial outpourings of lust, only to peter out a year or so later. However, Lucy's later pursuit of Edward's brother Robert seems far more ruthless and calculating, once more showing the potential advantages for women who nakedly view marriage as a key opportunity for one-off advancement in life rather than a vehicle for romantic fulfilment, which of course is Marianne's stance, at least in the early stages of the novel. In the final chapter, the narrator describes the tactics employed by Lucy to win the now far richer brother. Robert arrives initially to try to persuade Lucy to give up her engagement to Edward. Lucy listens attentively and manages to persuade him to return to continue persuading her. Austin explains, instead of talking of Edward, they came gradually to talk only of Robert, a subject on which he had always more to say than on any other, and in which he soon betrayed an interest even equal to his own. He was proud of his conquest, proud of tricking Edward, and very proud of marrying privately without his mother's consent. So Lucy manipulates Robert into falling for her by using a sharp understanding of his character. She recognises that he has a huge ego that can be massaged and so massages it by listening to him drone on remorselessly about himself. She knows that she is pretty and that shallow, vain men can be competitive. Thus she engineers a situation in which one brother can think he's out testosterone the other but actually is being used as a puppet. The tone Austin uses to sum up Lucy's ruthlessness is interesting. She writes, 
The whole of Lucy's behaviour in the affair and the prosperity which crowned it, therefore, may be held forth as a most encouraging instance of what an earnest and unceasing attention to self-interest, however its progress may be apparently obstructed, will do in securing every advantage of fortune with no other sacrifice than that of time and conscience. The tone, of course, is typically gently ironic. The sentence begins by seemingly praising Lucy for her successful conquests. It has been crowned with prosperity, can be viewed as a most encouraging exemplar for others, before dropping in references to her selfishness and questioning the moral rectitude of her actions. On the one hand, we are not intended to applaud Lucy for her ruthless flattery and subsequent successes. Eleanor is the heroine of the novel, not pretty, scheming Lucy. However, it needs to be pointed out that Lucy's effective stroking of, of Robert's ego, and later manhood, facilitates not one, but two relationships in which the couples are perfectly suited. Edward, of course, is free to marry Eleanor to become, in the words of Mrs Jennings, who knows a thing or two about relationships, the happiest couple in the world. Whilst doesn't a man whose vanity can be summed up by referencing a 15-minute quest for an appropriate toothpick case deserve someone as shallow and conniving as Lucy Steele? Austin's implication seems to be that female manipulation is an inevitable, albeit distasteful, consequence of a society which offers so few opportunities for women outside marriage. We don't have to like such behaviour, but it is going to happen and quite often be successful. Austin's novels also show us the power struggles within relationships. An early example of this is seen in Fanny's manipulation of her weak-willed, selfish husband, John, who promised his father on his deathbed to do everything in his power to make his half-sisters and stepmother comfortable. Fanny methodically whittles down her husband's tepid suggestions of financial settlements using a highly effective combination of flattery, arguments and emotive language. Following John's initial affirmation that they should part with £3,000, Fanny coaxes him into suggesting that half this sum would be more appropriate. She then responds, Oh, beyond anything great, what brother on earth would do half so much for his sisters, even if really his sisters, and as it is, only half-blood? But you have such a generous spirit. The use of exclamation shows her clearly feigned surprise at the extraordinary generosity of her husband's offer to reduce by half the amount he had previously determined to settle on his sisters. Oh, whilst the rhetorical question likewise suggests that his suggestion smacks of extraordinary munificence. He has suddenly and alarmingly positioned himself as the most liberal brother on planet Earth. But the key point is that Fanny is obviously not offering wholehearted praise, but subtly suggesting that his generosity may be disproportional. The sum is not great, but beyond anything great. The implication is that £500 each is far more than rational thought might dictate. Fanny develops her argument by deliberately drawing attention to the fact that he has a different mother to the three girls, and so they're not really his sisters something she repeats more explicitly in the subsequent sentence with the indignant exclamation, only half-blood. However, perhaps recognising that her role as a woman could only be to drop hints rather than state courses of action, to manipulate rather than to rule, she quickly steps back from her argument about the unworthiness of half-blood relations to offer dripping praise. Leaving her previous abrupt sentences, grammatically incomplete and hanging in order to ensure that John has the appropriate information to dictate his own decisions, Fanny finishes this short speech by giving her husband the opportunity he craves of deluding himself about his own good intentions. Austin clearly intends the reader to tut indignantly at the selfish greed of John and Fanny Dashwood. Indeed, in some ways, John is the more culpable, both because he is the one related to Eleanor, Marianne and Margaret, and also as, unlike Fanny, he completely deludes himself about his own motivations. But I wonder whether the modern reader may react slightly differently than to those reading the novel when it was first published 205 years ago. I can't help but think, 
What else could women of a certain class do during this period beyond giving instructions to servants, doting on children, gossiping and bitching? Fanny is bright and quick-witted. This is clearly seen in her adroit manipulation of language and her husband. Shorn of a fulfilling outlet for this intelligence, such as working in advertising, marketing or promotions, all career options for the modern day woman. Is it any wonder that she directs it ruthlessly to secure financial prosperity for herself and her brat? Austin shows us how women can manipulate men into marriage and once married into ceding a degree of power. However, she also shows the pain and suffering that women can experience in their relationships, particularly when the rules of propriety are brushed aside. The BBC's 2008 TV series based on the novel chooses to begin with a titillating example of this. Have a look. Do you truly love me? Trust me. Although we may not realise this at the time unless we have read the book, this is Willoughby and Eliza locked in passionate moments before the former leaves her pregnant, abandoned and appallingly vulnerable. In Austin's text, Willoughby's behaviour is summed up by Colonel Brandon. He had left the girl whose youth and innocence he had seduced in a situation of the utmost distress, with no creditable home, no help, no friends, ignorant of his address. This situation partly came about because Eliza was permitted by those in charge of her well-being to go ranging over the town and making what acquaintance they chose. So Austin shows the importance of restraint and overseen within relationships. Too much freedom can be dangerous and potentially result in heartache and ruthless ejection from society. Whilst Marianne does not suffer the same fate as Eliza, the latter is clearly intended as an example to the former as to what can occur if the boundaries of propriety are ignored. During the heady days of Marianne and Willoughby's courtship, the pair sneak away alone to Allenham, which Willoughby is due to inherit, and thus break all rules concerning appropriate behaviour for unmarried men and women. Maggie Lane, writing in Jane Austen's World, lists five prohibited acts between unengaged men and women, including using Christian names unless connected by family, driving in carriages alone together, correspondence, exchanging gifts, and any kind of intimate touching. Marianne breaks all of these rules at various points, leaving Eleanor disbelieving and furious. She rebukes her sister. If Eleanor was one day to be your own, Marianne, you would not be justified in what you have done. Subsequent events show the wisdom of Eleanor's words. Marianne is left half-broken and publicly humiliated. Whereas Eleanor retains her dignity throughout, Marianne self-indulgently wallows in a mess that is partly of her own making. Austin shows that actually, the rules and regulations of propriety offer women a degree of protection against unscrupulous, lustful men, and are ignored at your peril. Of course, a key reason Marianne pays scant attention to the rules of propriety is that she believes that the only relationships worth valuing are those which involve first-time romantic love. According to her, second attachments are sullied, mucky affairs and not to be contemplated at any cost. Eleanor discusses Marianne's hopeless idealism with Colonel Brandon in chapter 11 of the first volume. Following Brandon's careful questioning, Eleanor reveals that her sister allows no exceptions to her ideals, irrespective of potentially extenuating circumstances. I only know that I never yet heard her admit of any instance of a second attachment being pardonable. 
Brandon is asking these questions as he himself has had a previous attachment and is slowly but surely falling in love with a woman who, uncomfortably for a modern reader, is more than half his age and still technically a child. The irony here is that Brandon himself experienced such intense romantic feelings when he was Marianne's age, and so he is able to empathise with Marianne's rigid viewpoint, even though it, it excludes himself as a possible lover. Austin shows that such romantic, idealistic notions are unrealistic. The object of Marianne's romantic love, Willoughby, turns out to be unreliable and makes the decision to prioritise wealth over passionate feelings, leaving her devastated and physically ill. The end of the novel sees Marianne finally paired up with the faithful Colonel and recognising the necessity of compromise and steady constancy ahead of thrilling sexual attraction. Austin writes, instead of falling a sacrifice to an irresistible passion, as once she had fondly flattered herself with expecting, instead of remaining even forever with her mother and finding her only pleasures in retirement and study, as afterwards in her more calm and sober judgment she had determined on, she found herself at 19 submitting to new attachments, entering on new duties, placed in a new home, a wife, the mistress of a family, and the patroness of a village. Yearning for extremes is for the young and inexperienced. With maturity and experience comes the recognition that successful relationships stem more from quiet loyalty and practical everyday routines than explosions of volcanic passion. But the most successful relationships in the novel combine controlled passion, deeply held feelings of love and respect, with a recognition of the importance of propriety and moral values. Even when Eleanor is suffering, she continually manages to present a front of composed civility and decency, which maintains her self-respect. Arguably, the most awkward moment in the novel is in chapter 13 of volume 2, when Edward walks in on Lucy and Eleanor at Mrs Jennings's house in London. Edward is reluctantly yet striving to be honourably engaged to Lucy, but knows that he has almost certainly unwittingly misled and mistreated Eleanor during their time together at Norland. Eleanor knows about the engagement, as Lucy has told her, but as it is a secret, no one can mention it. The narrator describes the awkwardness of the first meeting. It is Eleanor who pulls herself together to give the impression of composure and normality. Almost everything that was said proceeded from Eleanor, who was obliged to volunteer all the information about her mother's health, their coming to town, etc., which Edward ought to have inquired about, but never did. Why does Eleanor make such an effort? Well, yes, on one level she is striving to maintain her own dignity. I sense that acting in a collected fashion gives her a degree of consolation within a currently rather unhappy existence. But she also does it because she really loves Edward and doesn't want him to feel awkward. She was anxious to preserve an atmosphere of normality for his sake and her own. In a completely different way, Edward also shows his belief in moral strength and trying to do the right thing, even if it may result in personal unhappiness. He maintains his engagement to Lucy Steele in spite of his own rapidly vanishing feelings for her and in spite of his mother's bullying fury. He explains retrospectively his reasons for doing so. I thought it my duty, independent of my feelings, to give her the option of continuing the engagement or not. Thus Eleanor and Edward make the perfect couple. Both have strong moral codes and recognise the importance of propriety. Both love and respect each other fully. Thus both deserve to return again to Mrs Jennings' words, to be the happiest couple in the world. So how does Austen present love and relationships in Sense and Sensibility? Well, she's a realist. She recognises implicitly, though doesn't rail against it explicitly, that the social climate of the time would inevitably result in financial security being a key motivating factor for relationships, especially for women. And actually, marrying for money may not leave you utterly miserable, in spite of what fairy tales may like us to believe. 
Will it be, for instance, may harbour a few regrets, but live to exert and frequently to enjoy himself. However, the happiest relationships are those shared by men and women who share common values, who respect each other, and who have always known or learned through bitter experience that romantic love at first sight may not produce the happily ever after. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production exploring the presentation of love and relationships in Sense and Sensibility. Many thanks for watching.